We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. But we are in, on the IGF forum, so we are in the various time zones. So I presume for some of us, rather good morning or good evening. Special thanks for those who are in the middle of the night and who has chosen to be with us instead of having a rest. There are some of us who are just in the middle of the night. It is a great honor for me to start the panel titled Cybersecurity and Crisis Management, Combining Cyber and Kinetic Threats, Best Practices. My name is Maciej Siciarek. I am the head of Cybersecurity Innovations and Development Department at NASC, National Research Institute in Poland, a public institution that has a very important role in Polish cybersecurity environment. Together with me on the left is Kasia Soku, a senior expert in strategic development of cybersecurity at NASC, who will support online communication channel and I hope fruitful Q&A session at the end of our meeting. IGF was expected to meet all of us in Poland here in Katowice, capital of Silesian Voivodeship in South Poland and the central city of the Upper Silesian Metropolitan Area but to the known problem of pandemic that we are facing all over the world for almost two years. We are meeting in hybrid formula, as well guests of the session as most of the panelists. Last year during IGF meeting, I said that I hope we were not yet fed up with number of online meetings. This year, I'm not so sure we are not. So we should face this specific symptom of crisis and manage it using digital tools and solutions. I hope no technical issues will disturb us today. Before, our, uh, before I will introduce our guests, one technical remark for audience present with us online. Of course, during the session, your microphones will be muted, but we invite you to use the online chat room and write your questions which can be addressed during the Q&A session. By the end of the panel, as I mentioned, you can address your questions either to specific speaker or generally to, the, to all panelists. Katarzyna will collect the questions and as I mentioned, help us with Q&A session. And the second remark for panelists, uh, we have only 75 minutes for whole panel. So, so we kindly uh, ask you to keep the limit of about seven minutes for each answer. So, after this brief introduction, it is my pleasure to welcome such distinguished guests who join us today from far and near as panelists. I wish we could host you all of you in person, but not today. Let me invite Mrs. Amy Mann, International Policy Specialist from U.S. National Institute of Standard and Technology, known as NIST. Welcome, Amy. Good morning. Are you with Good us? Morning. Are you here? Yes, thank you. Mr. Dong Guen Lee, Director of Incident Response Division at Korea Computer Emergency Response Team. Hello, Dong. Can you hear us? Okay. Nice to meet you. Uh, Mr. Johan Lepasar, Executive Director of ENISA, European Union Agency for Cybersecurity. Hello, Johan. And Mr. Jakub Boratyński, Head of Cybersecurity and Digital Privacy Policy Unit from European Commission, Digital Directorate General for Communications Networks, Content and Technology. Hello, Jakub. Good afternoon. And uh, only one panelist together with me. Thank you, Vital, that you are here. 
Mr. Witold Skomra, uh, head of the Critical Infrastructure Protection Department and also advisor to the chief of government center for security in Poland. Hello, Witold. Hello, everybody. So due to the increasing interdependency uh, of trade sectors and ICT system, it is inevitable to tighten the connections between cybersecurity and crisis management and face new challenges for digital security of world economy and not only economy, but also its influence of citizens' life. Crisis management connected to cybersecurity uh, is a global challenge with, which concern every country, but we all know that there are different ways and solutions applied by European Union and other countries. So uh, we are just in mixed uh, panelists. So starting the panel, I would like to first um, to pass the floor for those far, far away from us. Emmy, I'll start with US. Uh, Emmy, uh, you are representing uh, US National Institute of Standard and Technology. I know that the range of issues, security issues that uh, NIST is covering uh, on level of standards and recommendations is really very, very wide. Could you share with us general approach to the specific subject of combining cybersecurity and crisis management uh, on basis of NIST experience, possibly including some conclusions from evaluation process? Welcome, Amy. Thank you very much. And I, again, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this discussion today and join a great group of panelists. So thank you. I work, as you noted, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a non-regulatory agency at our U.S. Department of Commerce, and our role is to help advance measurement science and standards and technology in ways that can help improve our economic security and our quality of life. In our Information Technology Laboratory, we work to develop standards and guidelines that can help to cultivate trust and technology and we develop a number of cybersecurity and privacy resources in close collaboration, not just with our other US government partners, but also in close collaboration with the private sector, industry partners, and international partners to bring those perspectives into our tools and help keep them effective at managing cybersecurity risk. And it's forums like this and these opportunities to exchange information that really help us to refine and improve these tools and standards and guidelines. Under our Federal Information Security Modernization Act, FISMA, NIST has the role to develop these standards and guidelines and federal information processing standards that our U.S. government uses to secure our systems and that can be used in a time of managing an incident or a crisis. And they are voluntarily used by the private sector and by industry, but because they closely collaborated with us in the development of those standards, we have seen a lot of voluntary intake and we have seen our United States also use the uh, tools like our cybersecurity framework, our privacy framework and other guidance on that voluntary basis, incorporating it into some of their regulations and for some of their private sector acts. At NIST, we work closely with government agencies like the US Department of Homeland Security, who has our US CERT computer emergency response team that handles things from a more operational perspective but their work really does take into account and use the different resources that NIST uh, puts together through that close collaboration. And we have really seen a lot of use of these resources and learn from these different implementation and use of them to continue updating them. We convene regular stakeholder meetings to get input on how people have used it, whether in a crisis or other situations, and those successes and challenges help us to update them. Tools like our cybersecurity framework also leverage international standards and best practices that are already used and found to be of value throughout the world. Things like ISO 27001, ISA 62443, that is from a more operational perspective, and its own special publication, 853, which is a catalog of security and privacy controls used for federal information systems. And tools like our cybersecurity framework will leverage those for doing different cybersecurity outcomes is organized around identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, spanning the entire breadth of cybersecurity risk management from the preventive through to a reactive phase after an incident recurs. 
So under those functions like respond and recover, there are different actions and controls that can be applied to help achieve those functions using existing standards and guidelines. And we continue developing tools so that they can be used and the approach flexible enough to apply in our various critical infrastructure sectors, of which there are 16 in the United States. So this framework and approach can be used in the, whether it's in the healthcare sector, nuclear or energy, and those sectors do have some of their own regulations, but the cybersecurity framework is meant to be used alongside them. And we've learned from these sectors who have put together profiles of how to use the framework, and those best practices will then go into future iterations of the framework and help to make that useful and continue to be a tool that all of our critical infrastructure sectors can use, both being able to protect and try to mitigate response anything from an incident and be able to respond and recover if something does occur. That flexible approach has been found to be very useful and again used in the more operational context, although at NIST we develop the standards that can help be used for managing these crises rather than taking the first steps or from that operational perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Amy, uh, for sharing with us uh, your approach. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it will be very interesting to uh, mobilize in future the aspect of obligatory and uh, voluntary uh, uh, implementation of various regulations. It's, it's quite interesting. Now let's give the floor for Far Far East to Korea and uh, Mr. Gwen Lee, uh, Director of Incident Response Division at, at Korean CERT. Dong, uh, as I know, last summer, Korean government announced the New Deal Policy 2.0, which is mostly about economy strategy, but as a part of it, Ministry of Science and ICT announced a strategy to promote key cyber security policy. In this strategy, among long, long list of goals and aims on technical level, uh, we find also protection of important national facilities and strengthening security uh, capabilities, uh, cap capabilities of small and medium enterprises. Could you please introduce us a little bit uh, in your role in cybersecurity in Korea at the regulation level uh, and also operational, and especially implementation of the strategy and key challenges you are facing combining cybersecurity and crisis management as well locally in Korea as in your region? Yeah, uh, it's an honor to participate uh, in this uh, historic event as a panel meeting. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I will briefly uh, introduce CARE-CERT-CC. Uh, CARE-CERT-CC is a national CERT in the private sector of South Korea and is operated as a part of the KISA, uh, starting with a small team in 1996. Uh, about uh, 150 employees are, are currently uh, working for cybersecurity performance, uh, various tasks uh, as, such as responding to instance uh, uh, preventing campaigns and the cyber threat information sharing. And we have been responding to a major uh, cyber crisis in South Korea. Uh, the Korean government announced the, the Korean version of the New Deal uh, as a national project designed to revive the, the economy uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and uh, decided to create investments and jobs in three areas, uh, digital new deal, green new deal, and strengthen safety nets by uh, 2025. Uh, uh, in accordance with uh, the digital new deal uh, uh, policy related to cybersecurity, uh, the Ministry of Science and the ICT announced the uh, K cybersecurity strategies uh, in February this year. The K cybersecurity strategies presents tasks for establishing a digital uh, safe, safe national foundation, a strengthened response to uh, changes in the security paradigm, and expanding the foundation. Uh, for, for uh, fostering uh, the information protection 
uh, industry. Among them, I would like to uh, look at several major tasks uh, related to care success of KISA. Uh, first, care success will establish a cooperative system in which uh, major private uh, companies participate. Including IDC, uh, cloud service providers, and etc. cetera. Uh, it was named the K Cyber uh, Security Alliance. We had a, a kickoff, kickoff ceremony last month and plan to quickly spread the collect information to the private sector, uh, including major companies, uh, institutes, and the general public, and to support the development and the distribution of security patches in connection with security uh, companies. Uh, information sharing is carried out through CareSet CC's uh, cyber threat analysis and sharing system called uh, CTAS. And uh, small, medium sized uh, company and uh, uh, companies that uh, lack uh, threat analysis or processing cap uh, capabilities will be provided uh, easily uh, through website or emails uh, to narrow. Uh, the information gap. Uh, second, the, in the event of an accident, uh, incident anywhere in the country, uh, experts will be uh, dispatched to the site uh, to support the analysis, uh, investigation, uh, recovery, and prevention of recurrence. Uh, in this process, uh, it supports uh, the introduction of necessary products and the solutions by consult, uh, conducting a security consulting of companies in connection with private security companies. A third, uh, for the security of the supply chain, uh, which has become a big issue in recent, uh, recent years, a major software development uh, companies uh, in the multi-use and the public service sectors will be selected uh, to strengthen safety at each stages of software development. Uh, supply chain security companies are uh, promoting, promoting uh, the spread of uh, diag diagnostic tools that can increasingly implement uh, security systems on their own. Of course, CareSet CC provides a free, uh, a free personal PC checkup service called uh, My PC Carer, uh, which will expand the security checks to prevent the public facilities or personal PCs from uh, being abused by uh, attackers. And will provide a, a cyber notification service that uh, individually informs users of a threat information on PCs or IoT devices. Uh, last is, when uh, CAST CC conducts a uh, cybersecurity exercise uh, on crisis response uh, in the private sector in the first and second half of each year. The cyber exercise, which has been promoted since uh, 20, uh, uh, 2024, uh, currently consists of three areas uh, a hacking mail response, a DDoS attack response and uh, penetration test. As cybersecurity exercise was conducted on a set uh, topic uh, for a set uh, period of time every year, SMEs were with uh, insufficient uh, sufficient, uh, response uh, personally, had low frequency of participants and cyber exercise was uh, conducted on topics uh, that uh, did not match uh, the cooperate field. CASOT CC uh, has established a hacking mail response training platform to solve these difficulties of SMEs and is preparing to promote hacking mail response training uh, at any time uh, anyone wants for, from next year. Uh, until now, I briefly explained our story. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Donk. Uh, I think it's very, very important that you mentioned as well, a well coordinated um, plan for supporting uh, companies and also and also arranging uh, cyber exercises. Uh, I, I think that the topic of cyber exercises, maybe come cyber exercises, is worth of mentioning uh, at the end of the session, maybe something to arrange all together. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again. So uh, now let's give a voice to Europe. Uh, Johan, um, I'd like to start with Anissa as introduction to further discussion and uh, thought exchange. Could you please show us a big picture of current actions undertaken by Anissa in the field of large scale incidents um, coordination? It all started, as I remember, in 2016 with a request of Council of the European Union to the Commission for project of coordination in response to large scale. Could you say us more what happened next in what Anissa did in this subject? Thank you very much for the good question and thanks for inviting me to this panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at least virtually in Poland and at the same time also uh, around the world. Um, I would like to actually start from the fact that uh, uh, in 2016, the Council already agreed uh, to um, uh, apply a new directive uh, which set the kind of a framework for, uh, for critical sectors uh, when it comes to cyber security. Um, so that the Network Information Security Directive that came into enforce in 2018 um, set sort of a minimum standard for, for the industry in Europe. Um, but with it, it also included uh, a number of uh, bodies that were set up. And one of them was the, the CSERT network, the network of national certs that started to uh, coordinate and operate um, uh, within uh, Europe across borders. And I think this um, network, which now has existed more than five years, has really proved very useful. It, is, it was one of the pillars of the uh, European coordinated response to uh, large scale cybersecurity incidents. Uh, and it remains as one of the pillars. Um, and we've seen that uh, time and time again, uh, recently during the Kaseya uh, incident or uh, the uh, ransomware attack against the Irish healthcare sector, that CSAT network has proven a, a very good uh, platform to exchange information rapidly um, and also to coordinate member states' um, uh, responses. Uh, so what happened after, after the Council made its request, uh, within the form of the blueprint, of course, the Commission responded, uh, but it hasn't remained uh, static. Uh, the uh, Europe's coordinated response mechanism has evolved uh, over the past uh, five years. And I think that, that is something that we are very quite very proud of as well. So on top of the CSERT network, we also have now uh, the Cyclone, which is uh, the Cyber Crisis Liaison Officers Network, or sorry, Cyber Crisis Liaison Organization Network. It's a, it's a very complex name, uh, but the essence of all it is that the national cybersecurity agencies um, uh, not only coordinate and, and exchange information at the technical level, but they also at the operational level um, when it is needed. Um, the, the network has been set up. It has uh, several times it has uh, gathered and it has its own uh, clear goals uh, when it comes to increasing its capacity to coordinate any kind of a joint response to a large-scale cross-border crisis. Um, uh, above it, of course, what, what interest uh, agency uh, as an ESA is how, how the member states and how the EU bodies and institutions um, uh, collaborate together. With the Cybersecurity Act in 2019, ESA got the mandate to establish synergies between the EU bodies, institutions, and agencies that deal with operational cooperation and cybersecurity, and also uh, bridge these uh, synergies with, uh, with, with what the member states are doing. 
Uh, and of course, we've been doing that um, uh, gradually uh, when it comes to building up capacities in organizing exercises, uh, putting in place procedures. Um, but I think what the most important uh, is that we, we, we also are gradually building up a, a joint situational awareness and understanding uh, what goes on and, and, uh, and a system whereby we can uh, exchange information and also, of course, coordinate our activities um, cross-border when need be. And there, I think the recommendation of the commission that uh, was initiated last summer and that the council has already uh, uh, also made conclusions on uh, is also a step in this direction that we we see what what still remains to be done. What, what are the frameworks and what are the specific goals? When I when I say it's situational awareness, this is not something that can be defined in very simple terms. Um, and there is clear 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 as well that it it, it exists in, in multiple levels. Um, but I think having these more coordinated, more synergetic approach uh, to uh, to build Europe's uh, capacity to respond, um, also capacity to exchange information, capacity to, to understand, uh, in, in the end of the day, um, will help all the actors in the field, will, will help to make Europe more resilient, but also more um, um, uh, efficient when it comes to any kind of a response to potential large-scale cross-border crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Uh, uh, again, we've heard about exercises, so so it's something important, probably. Uh, let's go to Poland for a while. Um, I'd like to ask a question to my on-site guest, Mr. Witold Skomra, um, from Polish Government Center for Security. Uh, Witold, as an advisor to the head of Government Center for Security in Poland, you day by day deal with various issues of crisis management. Can you tell us um, how cybersecurity fits into the general view of the various dimensions of security? What has changed uh, in the recent years? Thank you. Maybe uh, at the beginning, some words about uh, Government Center for Security. We are a small office, uh, close, uh, only 60 uh, workers, uh, close to prime minister. We are preparing our administration for crisis situation and we coordinate information during them. So we are not uh, decision makers. We are only office. Uh, I'm personally responsible for uh, critical infrastructure protection. My team is the link between the world of administration and the world of business. Um, it's difficult because um, business has different goals, different language, the different attitude to, to security, for example. 10 years ago, we started to promote an integrated approach to security. We called it six dimensions of security or six pack, in short. Um, uh, typically, organizations uh, tend to divide security into different areas. For example, physical, technical, legal, cyber, personal security, and business continuity. We wanted to achieve a state uh, where there is only one security system with several dimensions. We have to notice there is no cyber security without physical protection of the server room. There is no physical security without control and access systems or under the digital uh, solutions. Of course, there is always a starting point for building such an integrated system. 10 years ago, it was physical security, maybe because uh, terrorist attacks at the time. Today, that starting point, it's cybersecurity. The risk in the cyberspace today are much higher than uh, any other. 
But uh, there has been another change in these uh, 10 years. Along with protecting IT systems has come the issue of protecting in industrial control system called, uh, called uh, OT. For critical infrastructure uh, protections, OT systems are, are much, uh, uh, much more difficult and much more important uh, than uh, protecting IT. However, the principle of one system with six dimensions still works, st still applies. Okay, thank you, Vitold. It's true that um, cybersecurity is not uh, the, it's no more add-on to the security. It's, it's uh, in various aspects, wherever base of, of security. So, uh, so thank you for this voice. Mm, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Jakub Boratyński. Uh, Jakub, I know it's not easy to split, to divide uh, ANISA and uh, European Commission activities. So maybe Johan uh, touched a bit, a, re a little bit area of your expertise, but I think I can ask you for commission strategic view on uh, completion of EU crisis management framework. Could you please tell us something about it? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maciej, and thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in IGF, at least in, a, in an online fashion. I mean, uh, Johan indeed has gave a very uh, comprehensive overview of all what we have done um, over the last years. I mean, let me maybe share a more general reflection that, I mean, we are at a stage that indeed uh, uh, the scale of the challenge is, is unparalleled. I mean, uh, cyber is everywhere because, of course, of, 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 of how, we, we, how far we have gone digital. And that actually creates a, a major challenge, actually, for, for, for policymakers. I mean, no doubt cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. It's a also a responsibility of citizens, obviously, of the companies, of governments. I mean, here in Europe, we have a very interesting, in a way, you know, a testing ground, because obviously, uh, you know, as a community of 27 member states, you know, we are indeed trying to, to see how we can at best uh, work together. There are major differences, you know, uh, among member states in terms of, you know, the capacities, their maturity. Uh, so in itself, it's a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, ground. Now, uh, if you look, uh, so what I would say is that uh, it's a challenge for, 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 for policymakers because cyber is everywhere. And the specific challenge of cyber crisis management is a case in point, because what we, when we speak about cyber crisis, ultimately, this is a crisis that would manifest itself in an impact on, on, in a tangible impact, in a kinetic impact, you know, the colonial pipeline attack in the US, which has been, which we are actually at least happy for that part, has been a trigger also for important wave of initiatives of the federal government. I mean, was a case in point, basically showing how basically, you know, the, the, uh, let's say the attack of a, of a, a group of, of, of cyber uh, criminals, uh, located basically on another side of, of, of the planet, you know, had a, such a profound and, and, and tangible impact on, on, the, uh, on the security of the supply. Uh, we uh, have to take this, you know, fully uh, into account in basically designing uh, the system that would work, which again is very much based on the idea of shared responsibility. In the EU, uh, as Johan referred to that, you know, we have been back uh, four years ago, you know, when we had the first recommendation of how to build this crisis management framework, so-called blueprint, uh, when indeed we identified the fact that if we want to be effective, we need actually, on the one hand, to address all the levels, you know, the, le the technical level represented by third communities, more policy level represented by cyber authorities, but ultimately we also have to make sure that we have a proper way of uh, articulating uh, this, call, uh, this, uh, this mechanism also at a political level, as indeed, given the stakes involved, in case of a major cyber crisis, this is definitely uh, a level of ministers or, or even prime ministers that would need to be involved. So this is not an easy task because of this complexity, because obviously it's an it's a area of a shared activity between the member states, between the European Union, and uh, also within that context, you know, this most recent initiative of joint cyber unit uh, is for us basically a, a, an opportunity to, to work towards completion of this framework, to actually 
implement in practice what we all know that cybersecurity has different dimensions. We cannot work in the silos that we need some ways of bringing together, you know, the, the let's say the civilian cybersecurity community with law enforcement, also the diplomatic dimensions of that and finally defense. So this is challenging at the level of every country. It is clearly even more challenging at the European level, but I think this is really the uh, direction in which we need to go. Uh, last but not least, we speak about crisis management, which is, uh, you know, a lot about exercising, about preparedness, about having the right situational awareness. This is also what uh, Johan was stressing. And of course, having the procedures in place so that we know whom to call when, you know, and I think in such a complex organism like the EU, you know, this is, this is clearly not easy. But with all of that, I think this basic investment in cyber resilience is of essence. So the work, you know, which is, I would say, bread and butter of what, for example, our uh, friends from NIST are doing, uh, you know, that investment uh, at the level of the companies is essential. And in that sense, uh, you know, we have this new, um, uh, new, new, let's say, uh, phase of the NIS directive, the baseline cybersecurity legislation, which we are now, uh, let's say, in an advanced legislative process, which is, you know, there are issues related to crisis management indeed uh, as well, but what is ultimately most essential is that we will have a, a really a, a significant part of, of European economy of important companies in many sectors now covered by uh, basically, uh, you know, baseline cybersecurity rules. And I think this is something that in terms of us being ready to the crisis when it comes is of fundamental importance. Again, all of that, of course, requires uh, sometimes out of the box thinking, you know, not just being stuck with the way we have been doing things forever. And obviously, uh, last but not least, and which is important message in the context of IGF, you know, finding ways how we can cooperate on this internationally, because of course the cyber threats are, are universal, you know, this, the, the, the same, <clears throat> uh, the same uh, attacks, you know, are, are, are targeting important assets, you know, uh, across the globe. So thanks a lot for, for this opportunity again, and back, back to Maciej. Thank you. Thank you, Jakub, for this um, introduction to the, um, uh, what commission does. Um, we'll, we'll be back in a while uh, in a question of international cooperation uh, and intercontinental uh, rubber <laughs> cooperation, but I'd like to um, uh, come back uh, to Poland for a while and ask Witold, uh, because um, Jakub was talking uh, a lot of regulations. Uh, we talked uh, about regulations recently, um, uh, talking about adaptation of EU regulations uh, and its possible amendments uh, uh, to the law in Poland. And you said that regulations supporting cybersecurity and crisis management, uh, mostly NIS and NIS2, the directive uh, and project of CER, the directive, so critical and infrastructure resilience, uh, impose various obligations to entities, including private sector, of course, which provides key essential services. Do you see, do you recognize any um, threats uh, to fulfillment of those commitments by entities and companies? Um, yes. Um... We finish the uh, first uh, step of uh, preparing uh, critical um, entities resilience directive or propo proposal of directive, of course, at the moment. Um, both of uh, directives are um, a very important, a very big step towards increasing the resilience of services uh, critical to, to security of uh, European Union residents. Critical entities will uh, have new obligations. However, there is a little talk about uh, government support for these entities. Of course, exercises, uh, know-how um, and something, but um, uh, there is still a prohibition on direct uh, fi financial uh, support of entities um, operating in the common market. Um, 
there are already situations um, where an entity is prepared to give up part of this business if the obligations are too costly. I often wonder if the uh, entity uh, maintaining a critical service is still a clear or regular uh, business or maybe a public institution and whether therefore part of the costs connected with uh, public security should not be paid by the state. Uh, maybe it's not the question for today, but uh, in my opinion, maintenance of electricity or of water supplies, it's too serious an issue to be left only uh, to the rules of the free market. So connecting uh, with government and, and private sector will change because of, of uh, cyber security. Thank you, Witold. Um, uh, I'd like to touch this international and intercontinental subject. Um, Johan, if I can um, uh, ask you about uh, the aspect of coordination, uh, international coordination, but I mean uh, pan-Europe coordination, uh, because I uh, in a while, I, I, I would like uh, to, to, to um, ask our panelists from Korea and US uh, about the uh, similar things. Uh, do you think? Um, how do you think we can we can come uh, um, on the international level? Because uh, the, the, the inside Europe coordination is for us uh, uh, only first step. Some some problems with coordination even in, in, in Europe were mentioned, but it's not enough. Uh, how to coordinate this aspect uh, on an uh, over-continental level? Well, it puts me in the quantum. Thanks very much for this, uh, obviously, because ENISA is an internal market agency, so our main focus and mandate is to enhance uh, whatever uh, takes place within the... I know, the I know. <laughs> um, but I think if you look beyond this, I mean, there are a number of uh, areas where we have common interests. Uh, and I think this is something that, of course, uh, if, if you look at capacity building and awareness, I think especially with, uh, with the partners uh, with which Europe shares similar values and has uh, longstanding um, uh, economic relationships, established relationships, I think there, there is a lot uh, which can be done uh, in terms of awareness raising, capacity building, resilience. Um, we talk about uh, standards uh, and, and potentially NISA is also now building certification schemes which will be applied within, within the internal market. But of course, we are interested that there are like-minded uh, partners uh, across the world um, understand these steps uh, and potentially also follow this. So I think there, there is, a, there is a, a lot of scope for, for cooperation and also when it comes to uh, responding to potential cyber crisis, of course, and this is not uh, now the territory where I feel comfortable about, but uh, you probably will uh, we'll need to ask uh, Cuba and, and unfortunately we don't have an external action, external action service in the, in the panel, but I think uh, um, the, the recent steps uh, uh, that Europe has taken vis-a-vis -vis the diplomatic toolbox uh, together with our allies across the globe show that there is also a, a, a scope for, for good cooperation and coordination on these matters. Okay, so if you have mentioned the external um, uh, action service, um, maybe Jakub can comment uh, this, this topic. Uh, Jakub, uh, can, you, can you imagine, well, exercises that are touching in, of course, in the civil area, uh, because uh, we know that then in in military area, we've got some some uh, exercises coordinated by by NATO, but can can you imagine well some some uh, exercises uh, combining uh, well uh, computer emergency response team or coordination networks from various continents, 
or generally how European Union can contribute to achieve preparedness to crisis touching mm -hmm. society and consequences of cyber incidents, what other ways we can we can yeah. find together? Well, I, I, indeed, I wouldn't prefer to speak for external action service, but just based on my understanding of how things are today, I mean, first of all, I mean, we, we have to realize, I mean, that in these matters, of course, trust is extremely important. And that is why, you know, uh, uh, promoting, you know, information sharing, close operational cooperation, basically takes time. I mean, we, we have this challenge everywhere. I mean, at all levels, I mean, you have this challenge, you know, at the level of member states, you have this challenge in Europe. Uh, and clearly, you know, when it comes to international arena, you know, the challenge is even bigger because you know, we, are, we are just, you know, we don't work for obvious reasons on a daily basis together. Uh, what you have said is extremely important. I mean, of course, the, the question of uh, the lying principles, uh, values uh, is of fundamental importance. I mean, in that sense, I think that, uh, you know, we, we can clearly see more room for cooperation with like-minded countries. You know, uh, if I, you know, refer to, to, to both representatives of, of, of the U US and, 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 and South Korea, who are on this call, of course, I mean, these are our definitely partners with whom we have established cyber dialogues. We coordinate our positions, not only on international arena, as we, for example, shared the, the vision of uh, of internet. Uh, now, I wouldn't be so specific to to to, to now speculate. Uh, you know how far you know can we have a specific common exercises? I would say clearly there is uh, uh, a room for cooperation. For example, within third community that exists, by the way, because there are different international forests on which this uh, uh, this cooperation is taking place. Uh, but I would say clearly now, you know, uh, we, we are seeing that, you know, in this particular moment, you know, uh, we would be overall, I think, stepping up our uh, cooperation with the US uh, on, on cyber issues. So I would say that definitely creates a space for some specific initiatives, you know, uh, that, that uh, would, would that could go further than is the case today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the, this session is too short to to touch uh, all the levels of, of coordination that are possible. I mean, technical uh, well, coordination, uh, strategic level, and at the end, this this level that we have also mentioned. So, politic and matter of diplomacy. Uh, but of course, uh, as you uh, as you Jakub uh, mentioned, our uh, partners from Korea and um, and US uh, so let's return to Korea um, Donk, if I can ask a question about um, your view on the, on international cooperation uh, as you have heard in European Union we develop some tools and structures of cooperations um, they are created and considered for future uh, could you point some main actions that may be possibly developed and implemented on uh, international level, uh, for example, with, with your attendance, uh, cooperation between Korea and uh, European Union, United States to avoid consequences, consequences of um, cyber incidents on citizens' life, economy, and so on? Yeah, uh, I believe that, that uh, international level future cooperation uh, beyond uh, Europe uh, and South Korea uh, can be considered uh, in several ways. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, could conduct a joint cyber security exercise for preparedness uh, of instance affecting the world uh, uh, such as uh, uh, ransomware or uh, instance uh, cases uh, where their infrastructure affects. Another is uh, uh, building a hotline uh, that can quickly exchange information uh, in the events of cyber threats, uh, as well as sharing information uh, to prevent uh, the spread of cyber threats in our uh, region. Uh, also, to make her, uh, one more suggestion, uh, it is uh, uh, thought that a campaign uh, to 
raise awareness uh, will be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dong. So, um, Amy, uh, could you comment uh, this topic of cooperation? Um, uh, Jakub mentioned that the trust is a key feature of cooperation. Yes, I think we can all agree with that. Um, Mr. Dunkley is talking about uh, uh, possible uh, common exercises that I also mentioned several times. Could you comment, could you, could you uh, tell us how, how, how do you see this possible cooperation? Um, and I think, um, uh, in fact, technical cooperation, exchanging various uh, uh, feeds from systems is a base uh, of, of cooperation to to learn more what's happening in, in our cyber spaces. Could you comment, Emmy? Thank you, and we'll definitely build off the excellent remarks we've heard so far from my fellow panelists, all very great points that have been raised. Noted, since I'm an international policy specialist, a lot of my work centers around the international engagement on our cybersecurity and privacy resources. And at NIST, we very much found value in these types of exchanges participating bilaterally and multilaterally in discussions on these approaches and resources then such as this and believe that it's very important to continue these conversations especially as the tools and resources and frameworks that we develop often need to be updated to keep up with changes and emerging threats and changes in the cybersecurity risk management landscape so we definitely value and want to continue engaging in this way to share information and learn from others and see how these types of tools can be adapted and continue to be approved to meet these types of threats. I had noted our cybersecurity framework that had been organized under those five functions of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And we had found value in that in the United States and from that collaboration with the private sector who also agreed and stakeholders saying that having that common language had been very important and those with varying levels of cybersecurity expertise could engage even at the level of those five functions and those who could have the more technical expertise to implement and use certain standards and guidelines to achieve those outcomes. When everyone is speaking on the same page, it helps to improve efficiency and help save time when responding in a crisis. And as we've had conversations on the framework, we have seen that others have agreed and used similar approaches and we learn from seeing that type of implementation as well. When our cybersecurity framework first came out in 2014, the president had asked us to work collaboratively and put out that first set of voluntary guidance that now has to be used by our government. But we had seen use internationally, including through Italy, who had adapted and used elements of that first version of the framework. Japan also was the first to translate and use it within national policy. Israel, putting it in their cyber defense methodology. Uruguay, who's on their fourth version of it. So, Seeing this process used and adapted across different countries and regions has been helpful for us and we found value in hearing how others have used it, seeing the ways that they've adapted it. And we even now have existing translations of the framework, including in Polish, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, Indonesian, and others. And helping to make that available as a tool for international engagement has been helpful as well and something we hope to continue doing in the future. The framework and many of our resources also leverage international standards and I think that's another important area where we want to continue cooperation with our partners throughout the world in the development of these standards and using that open and transparent collaborative process to develop standards that can be used and leveraged and apply across varieties of critical infrastructure sectors and within different countries to help improve the way that we can respond and manage uh, things that can happen during an incident. Even going very far back in uh, our history in our country, there was a great Baltimore fire where a crisis was happening, there was a fire burning, and people had come from neighboring areas bringing their hoses to try to help and contain this fire, but because there was not standardization of the equipment, hoses wouldn't work on the hydrants there, and that uh, was a step of time, and it was more challenging to try to contain that crisis because there were those standards in place to help reduce complexity and help uh, make more efficient the way that we respond. So we are still very much fans of continuing to develop these international standards that can be used in our tools and frameworks and help improve the way that we manage and mitigate effects from different crises. And even with our cybersecurity framework that we will be updating in the near future, we very much invite international and all types of engagement on the development process. And even when we last updated the framework back in 2018, we would hear from stakeholders about different and new emerging types of threats or different topics that should be incorporated into it to make it a useful tool. 
So now there is mention of supply chain and coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And just as an executive order helps start the development of the framework, NIST is also currently working with partners throughout the world on different executive order for improving our nation's cybersecurity that asks us to develop more tools and resources around su supply chain security, also an IOP labeling program and criteria for that. And we've again very much benefited from having participation in virtual workshops. We put out draft uh, documents for comment and that helps us to gather that input and put it into our guidance. And we also will keep working with industry and partners throughout the world. We have a National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence that again takes advantage of the fact that we can use and leverage existing technology and international standards to solve different cybersecurity problems across critical infrastructure sectors. We actually do have a physical lab that's set up with participants and industry members who come on a voluntary basis to help develop these solutions. And it comes out in practical guidance organized in those five functions of the cybersecurity framework, including respond and recover. Examples like in our healthcare sector, there have been a problem of how to more securely deploy medical infusion pumps since there are a lot of benefits to linking those pumps to electronic patient healthcare records, but also a lot of vulnerabilities introduced to uh, allow somebody to break in, change the dosage or turn it off or some other type of malicious incident. So by working with our partners there, we were able to develop some solutions where we don't always say that it's the best or the only solution, but just one way to approach that problem. So we want to continue those efforts of working with the private sector and international partners to develop these types of solutions for problems that we're seeing and also using aspects of the cybersecurity framework to develop a profile for managing ransomware risks, another type of threat that we have been seeing more recently and taking advantage of how an approach like the cybersecurity framework and those various outcomes for how to better protect critical infrastructure and respond if an incident occurs and restore your critical infrastructure services after <laughs> as you're responding, how that can be used in this specific type of context. And we have put that draft out for public comment and again inviting feedback as we refer to expertise around the world of how to approach this problem and want to take all of that into account as we develop this profile. So we do hope that we can continue this type of cooperation, speaking in these types of dialogues and participating in standards development organizations. Even ISO IEC has released some documents that have aspects of the cybersecurity framework and approach, but does not say NIST or US government, but is a document coming out of a standards development organization that can help make this type of risk management approach widely available. So those are the types of areas we hope to continue in. And I know there will be many other ways and the other opportunities for us to engage on these important areas. So thank you again for the chance to share some information on our approach. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I like very much the way you are talking about standardization. It's uh, nothing strange. You are representing a very strong institution in, in standardization. I can also confirm that uh, talking about uh, preparing guidelines for cybersecurity of cloud services in Poland, we are uh, looking uh, carefully what NIST is, uh, is giving in, in, in cybersecurity framework. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, Yes, we've got still about uh, 15 minutes. Kasia, do we have some questions at uh, Q&A chat room? Um, well, thank you, Maciej. Um, I think, if I may, uh, I think that the, the topic of cybersecurity and crisis management is equally important and equally interesting and broad. Uh, so therefore, I think we have just scratched the surface, really, uh, but because we have such a distinguished speakers and it's such a rare opportunity, um, I think we should take advantage of that and give an opportunity to maybe exchange some thoughts or some questions between the speakers. I think that um, if, uh, if maybe you would like to ask some questions from each other, make it more interactive, uh, that would be also of interest to us. If not, I would, uh, I would ask the audience um, to, I would like to give them the opportunity to, to ask some questions because clearly uh, the question generated a lot of uh, interest uh, and it is such a broad issue. Uh, so therefore, uh, maybe our distinguished guests, do you have any questions uh, to each other?
If not, then I would like to turn the floor to our audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions? Great. There are Let two me... hands up. Okay. Mm, Let me pass the floor uh, to our first guest. Okay, I have a question for Mr. Lepasar. Uh, could you tell us something more about the role um, of Joint Cyber Unit in the cybersecurity ecosystem of European Union? Thank you for the question. I think uh, we, how much time do we have? Fifteen minutes. Yeah. Okay. We've got still fifteen minutes. Sometimes for closing remarks. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So yeah, of, of course, uh, Jakub Poratinski can also uh, chip into this. We've had uh, numerous seminars amongst the EU actors, also between member states, and we are still not there of saying what the precise role is. I think it is very much work in progress. I think the concept of the Joint Cyber Unit is quite clear that uh, there should be more synergies built uh, between uh, first the EU institutions, bodies and agency when it comes to uh, building resilience but also uh, synergizing their, their own capacities in order to help member states to respond uh, to large scale cross border uh, cyber incidents at the EU level, and then of course uh, how to to uh, also facilitate the coordination collaboration between the member states in, in such uh, crisis. So I think you know that that is the overall uh, premise of of the joint cyber unit. It is not a unit. There is nowhere anywhere a, a specific uh, structural entity. Huh? It is more like a platform or network or an umbrella. Uh, of existing cooperation mechanisms to to uh, to make them more um, uh, efficient, uh, streamline them a bit, but also uh, uh, see whether there are any gaps that uh, still needs to be fulfilled. For I, for me, first and foremost, what I see is uh, is the uh, creation of a uh, common situational awareness. Uh, between the EU actors, but also between EU actors and the member states uh, to see how the EU actors can contribute and add value to the situational awareness of the member states. I think that, that's, that's the first step for me and everything else follows from that. Yeah, okay, so, so it's kind of a new, new cooperation idea, which is uh, uh, well, next puzzle um, among the CSIRT network, Cyclone network, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question from audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is George. I represent the Georgian Information Security Association. Uh, I have two questions. One to Mr. Lepasar as well. Um, you mentioned the cooperation between the member countries and um, the the different opportunities for them. So. Uh, of course, my question is about the uh, the countries beyond the EU, which are the associated members. So uh, apart from the, um, the harmonization twinning projects, which run in almost two years right now, we have the EU um, twinning project to harmonize the uh, Georgian cyber legislation to the uh, NIST directive. But... Um, I mean, like this, this is okay, but what about the other opportunities for more tangible and technical expertise? I mean, like I receive a lot of uh, uh, offers on LinkedIn, for example, about cooperation for ENISA in terms of the cyber expertise and consultancy. But when they, when it comes to the nationality, when they receive, oh, you're not the EU member country national. So sorry for that. So it's a final stage actually where, so it's about my personal experience, but about the institutional experience, what opportunities and um, uh, chances, so called, we can say we'll have the member, not member countries, but associated member countries, which tried and which are knocking on the EU doors, as we know, the, the playground for our 
uh, the adversaries often are Ukraine and Georgia in terms of the cyber as well, um, apart from the other playgrounds. So that's that's for for Mr. Lepasar. And one quick question for Miss uh, Miss Mann for from the NIST will be about the uh, the we have the risk management framework. The we have the cybersecurity framework revised and etc. So is it expected to be some somehow combined version of that? In in the new year's future to have the like the csf the next uh, edition but incorporated uh, with the rmf as well thank you thank you in advance okay so so if we can start with a question to johan lepasar and thank you for for our georgian question yeah it's, it's a very interesting aspect so uh, as i mentioned of course i mean uh, the uh, and it's is the internal market agency. So whatever we do uh, uh, beyond the borders of, uh, of, of, the, of the internal markets needs to add value to, to our mandate. And previously when the question uh, was um, raised, then I mentioned awareness. And I think I would like to specify uh, awareness about what? I think there is merit, uh, especially uh, with uh, with the um, Canada and associated or neighborhood countries uh, to understand the threats and the risks uh, in a similar fashion. So I think, of course, uh, raising awareness there uh, so that we, we, we both understand uh, what the threat landscape looks, looks like, how would be potentially the best ways to respond, what are the risk assessment methods as well. I mean, when we talk about technical terms, there is a lot to do in, 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 in the taxonomy so that we have a, a clear understanding of what we are talking about. So I think uh, uh, these um, avenues are something that I would like to explore. But again, there the, the, uh, the keys of the cooperation are held uh, by the member states and the external action service and ISA is there to help and assist, but we are not driving this cooperation forward. Thank you. Thank you, Han, and uh, question to Amy. Thank you, very much appreciate that question and understanding that at NIST, we do have a lot of various frameworks, as you noted, our cybersecurity and risk management frameworks. And we had also recently published a privacy framework and our national initiative for cybersecurity education, NICE, had recently updated their workforce framework that shows different competencies and ways to better achieve and retain and train a cybersecurity staff. So since we do have various documents out there, we are constantly looking for ways that we can better integrate, make them a little bit more aligned as the privacy framework came out in 2020 and we made it similar in structure to the cybersecurity framework with five functions and categories to help make them a bit more complementary and better able to be used together. As of now, we don't have one sort of framework that incorporates all of them, but we have continued to try to put out guidance to show how these uh, frameworks can be used together and better integrated. And that's an area that we are always looking for more input on how we can better do this. And I noted earlier that we will be updating the cybersecurity framework. And we'll be also doing that in conjunction with our executive order to produce supply chain security guidance and maybe look for ways how that update of the cybersecurity framework can help achieve those goals, whether a framework on that supply chain area. So we'll continue having these events and asking for ideas on how we can better incorporate these different types of frameworks and make them useful and better able to be interoperable with each other. But for now, we do have the various ones out there and guidance that we put out that showed how they can be used together. But again, always open to feedback on whether that looks like we need one that does better integrate all of them together or continue this uh, specific type of guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, any more questions from audience? Um, maybe maybe one question from chat from the chat room. Uh, we we are almost uh, run out of time, so. I will let let me give the message. Uh, if any of the questions it's, is not answered, we'll try to send them to the to the uh, panelists and uh, answer in written form. You can also refer to the email address cyberpolicy at uh, nasc.pl nask.pl cyberpolicy at nasc.pl we can uh, we can be back with with answers but please kasia if you can catch something from the uh, chat room 
So unfortunately, as usually, we have more questions than time available. But let me just uh, maybe address uh, one of the questions from Mr. Amir Mokaberi. Hello, everyone and distinguished panelists. I am Amir Mokaberi from Iranian academic community. My question is, don't you think that it is better to totally ban destructive cyber attack with such a huge effect on civilians by legally binding instruments at global level rather than regulating cyber operations in the interest of those uh, of those who have already offensive capabilities and doctrines? Okay, um, well, anyone would like to address uh, address that question? Yeah. Any I mean, of maybe, our speakers? Yeah, maybe I, I will come. I mean, if, if I think we, it's always important to remember that we have actually a very robust framework, uh, which is provided by Budapest Convention, which was agreed uh, basically 20 years ago, which is, I think, by the way, a remarkable example of how in this fast changing area, uh, there was really a commendable effort of, of, of you know, defining you know, the type of cyber crimes in a fairly neutral technologically manner. Now, uh, so, I mean, that has been very much position of, 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 of the EU and of, of uh, you know, of a number of like-minded countries that this is, you know, really a very useful tool. I mean, and even if it is not being ratified as such, it has been also used as a blueprint for, for, for national uh, cyber laws. Now, we have, of course, an ongoing in, in the UN set, uh, uh, at early stage, uh, but I think on that, uh, it's clearly not going to be easy to reach an agreement as it is very difficult to actually um, completely uh, um, somehow divide or take out of the context, you know, the issue of, of, of fighting cybercrime for also uh, our views uh, of how we see basically internet to be governed internationally on you know, that we do not have a consensus. Uh, uh, I mean, and we do not have a consensus in the context of, of, uh, of, of the UN. So I, I think that what, again, could be really a, a good step forward, I mean, just basically to build, uh, which have many countries did it actually, the, the, the laws based on the uh, based on what has been done uh, in the context of Budapest Convention. Thank you, Jakub. Uh, I was sure that 75 minutes is not enough for such meeting, but uh, we don't have more time. Um, just a while before we started, somebody asked me if I plan any closing remarks. Uh, remarks, And I said, no, no, rather not. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, while later uh, I thought uh, it may be rather time for opening remarks because I, I strongly believe uh, it's worth of opening remarks for future cooperation. And um, even though cooperation uh, um, approach, those are well words that are that are um, recognized as, as sort of buzzwords when we talk about cybersecurity. I strongly believe that we should concentrate on uh, uh, real uh, cooperation uh, in Europe. Uh, and also, thank you very much for, for Georgia for the question about the uh, uh, countries that are very close to Europe uh, with, with some ambitions and uh, with uh, for future association with with European Union, uh, so so it, those are also, also very important questions about cooperation. Uh, so let's leave it as opening remarks for future. Uh, I hope we may we will publish uh, some summary of the session and uh, um, feel free to contact us. Uh, we we will invite all your questions or or, or all your suggestion to, to well fulfill fulfill this uh, information about cooperation and uh, make stronger um, connections between cybersecurity and crisis management many thanks for all who took part in the session uh, my special thanks uh, for presence and contribution to the panelists. Uh, thank you, Emmy. Mm, thank you, Donk. Uh, thank you, Johan. Thank you, Jakub. And thank you, Witold. 
uh, really special thanks to Korea. It's uh, later than one o'clock in the night, so Dong, uh, uh, special thanks from, from Katowice. Uh, thank you very much and uh, feel, feel welcome to contact us. Thank you. Thank you.